All right. My name is David, um, and this is Mac up here on stage as well. He's our, uh, uh, our double for Louise. Uh, unfortunately, Louise is at uh, pH neutral, so he's kind of far away. Um, but Mac is the next best thing. He and I are on the network team. We've been doing this stuff for quite a while together. So, all right. Feels like quite a while. Feels like quite a while. So we're going to talk about knock goons, talk about us a little bit, um, talk about some of our goals, challenges, uh, the network at a high level, um, sort of the evolution of the infrastructure, some of the wired components that go into the network, and the wireless components that go into the network. And then some future stuff that we're going to be looking at, hopefully we'll have ready for this year's con, um, and all sorts of fun stuff. So who here is part of a hackerspace? Who here is not? Why are you not? <laughs> Find your local hackerspace. They're, they're a great place to meet like-minded people, just like all the people that are here in this con. Um, I, I'm president of the Twin Cities Maker Group. Basically, it's a 4,500 square foot warehouse that we rent out. Now we're, we're actually going to be increasing it to 7,800 square feet uh, in a couple of days here. We, we've just signed the lease last week. But anyway, it's a good, good thing to get together, work on projects, uh, work with others that maybe have ideas to help you out on things. That's a great place to learn, great pa place to teach others. Um, there's also something called the School Factory. So if you've got, if there are people out there who want to start a hackerspace, go check out the School Factory. They've got a bunch of programs for getting stuff going. So um, I'm not going to read all the slides up there, all the, the stuff that's on there. Also, uh, DC groups, who, who here is part of a DC group? All right. Um, if you're in an area and you want to start a DC group, you know, please feel free to do so or find someone who is actually out there who's, who's part of the, uh, the, maybe the primary contact for your DEF CON, local DEF CON group. Um, again, these are also really kind of nice places to get together. Um, ideally, you know, the DEF CON groups are not, I don't want to call 2600 script kitty, but they tend to attract some of that, and the, the DEF CON groups seem to be a, a much more professional place, professional realm for people to get together and talk about InfoSec. Um, all right, anyway. So this is our meme for today. <laughs> uh, we will be interspersing some of these throughout the slides. Feel free to laugh or not. Um, this is actually my, one of my coworkers. We took a picture of him and Went to memegenerator.net, I think is what it was. And uh, yeah, anyway. So Louise is director of Spider Labs in Latin America. Uh, Spider Labs, who knows who sp what Spider Labs is? OK, so Spider Labs is basically a pen test group that's within Trustwave. Um, they paid for my travel to come here, so I have to kind of say, hey, they're, they're a good group. Uh, and I, I do truly believe that they are a good group. It's a good group of people. So whore, whore. thanks. My, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Now, let's talk about Mac. So, Chris McHenry, aka Mac. Uh, I am a systems architect for a small little company called Sony Network Entertainment. Um, obviously, doing a little bit of DEF CON, doing, uh, I've done other system administration uh, activities. Um, not a whole lot else on there right now. Been a little busy the last month. So sad. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll leave that one by, by itself. So, but we're here to talk about DEF CON. We're here to talk about the DEF CON network, hopefully. So, a little bit of background, some of the network history. Um, DC1, DEF CON 1, Sahara, no network. SANS, no network. Tropicana for DEF CON 3, no network. Um, Monte Carlo uh, apparently had some interwebs. Um, but we don't, I don't, I don't know if anybody was quite clear. I think we all got too drunk to remember. Um, DEF CON 5, we actually had a T1 brought in. Uh, unfortunately, the maintenance guy went home for the weekend and didn't extend it up to the conference floor. So it's like, okay, well, that's, that's a maintenance fail. Uh, DEF CON 6, does anybody remember the Plaza Hotel? <coughs> Ew, what a horrible hotel. I, I mean, it's just really gross. Um, we had a T1 line dropped in and a DSL line dropped in. Uh, we were load balancing those on, a, I think, a, a little 
uh, I think it was FreeBSD box that Major Mal put together. Um, there was also a capture the flag network and a public network. So there wasn't really a lot of segre segregation or segmentation. Uh, then at DEF CON, starting at DEF CON 7, we started at the Alexis Park. Um, basically, we're there um, from 7 to 12. And I think we started out piggybacking on the Alexis's par Alexis Park's DSL, and then we pig piggybacked on a T1 that they had for the convention. We did that for a number of years um, until DEF CON 13 when we actually got a high-speed wireless point-to-point -point link. Um, which was great, you know, we were able to get, I believe it was five megabits, it might have been eight by the time we left, but I don't think it was anything ab above that. Um, then once we moved to the Riviera Hotel, we started out with six megabits and kind of increased it every, you know, every year we almost doubled it um, up until this last year when we had 100, 100 megabits. And there's kind of a funny story, so <coughs> uh, we paid for 80 megs, and I think it was it Friday or Saturday they called us up. I think it was Saturday. Sa Saturday. It was already well into the weekend. Saturday, uh, someone from the DEF CON network had been running a DDoS against some Amazon environment. It wasn't us. I mean, it wasn't me. I, I was doing something else. Uh, but you, I, you I did present on that. Yeah, I was DDoSing someone else. But so <laughs> someone who didn't care. But um, they called us up and said, hey, you know, can you guys block this traffic? Okay, sure, why not? What the hell? They're like, okay, and we've upped your bandwidth to 100 megs. Oh, excellent. So, you know, we scratch their back, they scratch ours. We do that that or they're just really working at cross-cutting effect because they give us more bandwidth to DDoS people. I uh, yeah, more bandwidth, <laughs> right? We <laughs> said sure, they, they said sure, so it all worked out. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice of them, you know. Um, so I've been a goon since DEF CON 6. Uh, Louise is, Louise actually, um, when we started, when we bought the Aruba gear, um, he came, he kind of came along as an engineer. And at the end of the con, he'd been very helpful, helping out, getting things going. He's always available. Um, so we kind of were like, all right, you want to be a goon now? Um, he said, sure. So. He pays different, but he's still accepted. Yeah, yeah, pay is, Totally different. Anyway, there is none. We're all volunteers. But um, then Max started at DEF CON 16 and has been helping out with uh, basically the wired network infrastructure since then. Yeah. All right, so some of our goals for the DEF CON network. I mean, back in the uh, early days, I think probably up until the point we bought the Aruba controller, uh, it was sort of a free-for-all. Sort of like, all right, let's get network out there. It may or may not work. Someone may or may not own our switches. Stuff may not work. Stuff may happen. Uh, it was a best effort, really. It's like UDP traffic, right? Um, so we kind of, back when we started at the Rio, we, we kind of reevaluated it and said, all right, w we need to have something that's much more reliable, right? Reliable connectivity is, is key. Uh, the other thing was secure-ish. Um, you know, we're not going for top-of-the-line top security, 802.1x on everything, and you know, all sorts of extra controls that may limit or inhibit the conference. I mean, we're only there for three days, right? So it has to be quick and easy to do this stuff. Um, Wi-Fi in every area. Um, when we started at the Alexis Park, we, we had Ghent, um, who worked for EXO, borrow a Catalyst 4006. And so he shows up with this big ass Cisco switch, pulls it out of his truck. I'm like, what are we going to do with that? All right, well, let's plug it in. So we plugged it in, and this was at the Alexis Park. And then we proceeded to light up all the ports in the hallway, all the ports everywhere, right? Got everybody going, and then we soon realized that people figured out that the ports were live, so they would find a table, move it over into the hall, plug in, and then there would be this effect of daisy-chained hubs going down the hallway. <laughs> we're like, yeah, I guess the fire marshal might not like that. So th that next year, I think, 
uh, DEF CON 8 or 9, we, we basically said, all right, we, we can't light up ports unless there's a need for it. Um, and we need to have Wi-Fi everywhere so that people aren't hanging out in the hallways, daisy chained down the hall. So, I mean, it was interesting. You had these little communities of people that would say, oh, can I, can I plug in? Sure. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, the other thing we needed to be able to do was segment the traffic. I mean, basically, we, we wanted to make sure that, you know, the press wouldn't get owned by someone who's sitting down in the, on the, the conference floor. Um, and so we, we created a bunch of different VLANs. Uh, public VLAN, speakers, press, green room, vendors, um, CTF networks, any sort of contest networks, um, info booth, public servers, registration desk. I mean, all of these areas had to be protected. And there's, there's more. These are just examples. Um, examples that we wanted to put together. Now, obviously, if you're on the, the local network, the local segment, you're going to be able to do a man-in-the-middle attack, right? But we're reducing some of that scope. Uh, ideally, if you're a press person and you're sitting in the press room, someone's not going to do that. Although that happened at Black Hat, you know, someone who had press credentials decided to do a man-in-the-middle attack of someone who was sitting in the press room. It's kind of annoying, but what can you do? I mean, people have to have access without you saying, here's a username and password, at, at least in this case. Um, all right. So challenges, money. Uh, we don't tend to have a lot of it. Did we mention it's a volunteer effort? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we were trying to do this as cheaply as possible without breaking the bank. So. Um, <clears throat> like the Aruba controller was probably the first purchase that was um, the most expensive for us, I think. I th it was also the, the most current purchase, you know, of recent year. Yeah. yeah. Everything else tends to be secondhand used equipment. Um, and I think even the Aruba was used, but not all of the access points were. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Which controller? Oh, uh, Louise, where are you? <laughs> Louise, I. I th I think yeah. it's like a 4,000? 4,000, I think, is what comes to mind. Have we have 44. 44. Oh. Yeah. We'll get, we'll get to that. We, yeah, we got a whole slide on that shit. So, um, so the other problem we had was at the Alexis Park, it was not a union hotel, which was good and bad. It was good from the perspective that, hey, we need to put something up. Oh, okay. Go do it, right? I mean, we'd be driving around on one of those, you know, scissor lifts that go up all the way to the ceiling at 3 o'clock in the morning, zip tying access points to the ceiling, right? And then running around doing all that crap. I mean, and that was all of the network team was absolutely involved in doing everything. Um, wasn't like we could say, hey, hotel staff, do this for us, right? So it was good and bad. Um, when we went to the, the Riviera, it was a, a totally union staff hotel, which means that I can't get up on a scissors lift and touch you know, anything in the ceiling or anything on the, the floor because it all has to be run by their union. If it's not run by their union, they can file a grievance and you know, do all sorts of weird stuff for our con, cost us money, it's just stupid stuff. So we you know, basically had to plan a little bit better as well. Um, the other thing, did, so did anybody actually go to the Alexis Park in the tent? Does anybody remember that? Uh, yeah. So <coughs> we had, I think the first year we, we had the tent, we ran like five strands of Cat 5. It was a really bizarre run. It would go, I'm trying to remember what it was, but it would go from our, our head end like I think via HPNA to like a server room that was back behind the registration desk up there, and then from there it went to um, Cat Five that went out the door around down uh, one of the, the the parking lot area and across the parking lot and into the tent. And about 3:30 in the afternoon, people would say, "Oh, we, we can't get on the internet in, in the tent." We're like, well, "What do you what? Huh? Well." the cable would heat up and it would start getting huge loss because we're running well over the uh, you know, 300 feet distance. Um, 
so it was very frustrating, very frustrating for us to, to run networking to all these rooms because there wasn't an infrastructure uh, at the Alexis Park. When we got over to the, the Riviera, they had fiber running between all the closets. Most. Mo most, most of the closets. There was one closet that didn't have anything, but um, we figured we got around that. It worked. Um, and the fiber was a big upgrade for us from the perspective that now we could do gigabit on the backbone and not have to worry about you know, stuff failing and, and whatnot. Catching on fire. Catching on fire. Yeah, the cable heating up. Um, the other thing, so bandwidth. Um, I'm trying to remember what, it, basically a couple of years ago, everybody got smartphones and decided that, oh, well, I'm not going to use the Wi-Fi. So you saw this sort of dip of users. And then as everybody else got phones that next year, you, you kind of saw it uh, dip up because nobody could use the 3G network in the hotel. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll connect to Wi-Fi now because the Wi-Fi is faster than you know, my 3G phone. Um, and then people started using mobile video, stuff like that, and so the bandwidth requirements kept going up and up. Yeah, and that was the same time you know, we started introducing w WPA2 such that people were more inclined to use the network uh, rather than just being afraid of it. Yeah, that was this last year. Was, yeah. yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we have is device compatibility. Uh, there was a couple of Android phones that wouldn't get on the network, and I think the iPad wouldn't get on the network. It was just weird stuff. Well, it'd get on, but it wouldn't stay on. That was always the fun. Yeah, like it'd come up do something yeah, and then it went into sleep mode and then just never came back yeah. to the network. So. Um, user density is also an issue. If you get too many clients in one area, they're fighting for channel space, they're fighting for access to the, the APs. And I mean, this is something that you see in a lot of conferences. You just, you know, there's a lot of people in one space. Our user base tends to have a lot more devices. Um, we lot. average more than one per person kind of thing. Yeah. Hopefully, maybe, right? I think we all have computers, right? And then reliability. Reliability is also, again, you know, kind of comes back to our goals of, hey, this has to be reliable. People have to be able to get on the network. People have to be able to use it. If they can't use it, they're not going to trust it. They're not going to come back to it. All right. Um, so it's Challenges continued. Time. Uh, basically, we have one week. Uh, well, we have three days to complete the setup. We arrive, we're there from Sunday uh, before the con to Monday after the con, uh, at a minimum, just from the perspective that Monday morning we hit the ground running, we get access to all our spaces, we kind of do a pre deployment of all our gear, we deploy the, the firewalls, we deploy everything that's core infrastructure. Tuesday, we figure out what rooms are going to be wired up, and then basically patch all the stuff, and then Wednesday, we test everything. We hope. We hope. I mean, there's, there's a lot of issues that come up with that, not only on the, you know, nothing ever works right the first time, but also just we've had times, even at the RIV, where we wouldn't get rooms until Wednesday morning. Yeah, which is annoying. Just, you know, I mean, you'd be patching at the last minute and hoping you could get a security guard to escort you into these, you know, into the IDFs and the MDFs where the, all the gear lives. Um, and then making sure you also have the union personnel to tape down the cables. And so that was coordination. Lots of <coughs> coordination. Um, we typically, I, I think I would say it's about 38 hours that we work in the first three days. So we, we typically start at like 8 or 9 o'clock on a Monday morning, and we're there till, you know, I don't know, 10 or 11 or 12 or one or two sometimes. You know, it depends on how organized everything is, how, how quickly the setup's going. But um, I've never thought of counting it. That's just the odd part. Like, yeah. It goes on for days. People come from across the country. That's another thing we have to kind of coordinate schedules. Say, all right, when are, you, when are you coming in? Yeah, when, when do you drop in? Canada. So we have uh, uh, the video guy, Derek, uh, who does the DC TV, the DEF CON TV. He actually comes in from Canada, um, which has been a challenge for him in the past because he's like, I, I can't ship you a box because they're going to charge me for it. What? Yeah. So he, he ch typically will either have one of us get, get him boxes or he'll go to Fry's when he gets on site and pick up a cheap PC and that's what he uses for the, for the con. Um, the team is kind of broken out into 
infrastructure, Wi-Fi, and video. Uh, a lot of us do dual duties across all of that. So like management types might work on the Wi-Fi or, or whatever. Um, and it does require a bit of logistics and planning before we land. And that the logistics, <laughs> the logistics comes from the fact that, <clears throat> again, we have to hand this stuff off to a union member, right? So either we have to have a sheet documented with here's where your access points are going, or, you know, or something along those lines, so that they then hand it off to their oh, what they call them? I don't know. They're, they're like union riggers or something that can climb up in the ceilings and you know put put up the access points or something. So. Which is good, because now I don't have to wander around in the ceiling anymore. <laughs> um, although there was a catwalk at the Riviera that we had to go through and put access points on and, and do all sorts of fun stuff there. But <clears throat> All right, so the, the firewall is basically, all the VLANs are trunked directly to the firewall. Um, you know, VLAN doesn't terminate anywhere else. We don't have any dynamic routing. It's all static routes. Um, and it's basically static routes to the internet, you know. If you want to go someplace, you have to hit the firewall to go someplace. Um, this last year, we actually did a FreeBSD install, um, just based on the fact that the SMP in OpenBSD and also some of the, the, the packet drivers were also not being maintained or, you know, uh, essentially optimized for speed. Uh, we found that I think we were able to get a little bit better performance out of the FreeBSD firewall and the, the networking components than we did with an OpenBSD firewall. Um, it was really very tough for me to, to make that decision. I did not want to do that. I'm, I'm kind of a paranoid as far as like, all right, I'm going to make sure that whatever we're running has minimal services and has, you know, is basically as locked down as it can be, right? Why um, would that be? I, I think we're at a hackers conference, yeah. right? No, anyway, you didn't sign up to be at a hackers. Not that I knew. What, well, did you think this was a clown show? I ended up in DJ with with you know Kaminsky one night, and the next morning, that's where I was. Did you take Dan Kaminsky with you? No. Anyway, uh, so prior to, prior to the last year, it was OpenBSD every year, uh, starting at DEF CON 10, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so let's see, uh, static routes, VLANs, we have about 130 VLANs that we provision. Um, 50 of them are dedicated towards the public Wi-Fi, 50 of them are dedicated towards the WPA2 Wi-Fi. Um, and 30 are for all the other areas that we have out there. <coughs> um, there's a table of doom. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but basically if you want to do some packet dumps, you can come up and hook up to the table of doom, dump, dump traffic from our, our network. We do a span port essentially up to that. Um, you have to pre-register with us. You can't just bring a box and say, here you go, because we kind of have to plan that. Basically, we have to plan and, you know, if we have to buy equipment or bring equipment. So, uh, and then the Wall of Sheep also gets uh, uh, a span port as well. They get all the unencrypted open Wi-Fi and then the contests and a few other miscellaneous VLANs. Um, we kind of made the decision that, you know, if, if we're, if we're going to make a network available that has encryption on it and that is supposed to be secure, then we probably shouldn't span that over to the Wall of Sheep. Uh, it just made sense, you know. People are going are gonna to expect privacy, and I want I want people to be able to get on the network having that same expectation. And if it goes over to the wall of sheep, that means they're not going to use it again. And and we actually ran into a little bit of trouble with that because there was a lot of questions of like, we're just not seeing the packet counts that we expect. And you know, finally took us a little while to realize it just was a use change. Everyone had switched over to the secured network, and it just. You yeah. weren't seeing a whole lot. No, no, I mean, very few people were using the unencrypted Wi-Fi, so. Mmm, <laughs> macaroni. Got some shells? Hell yeah, macaroni! All right. So here's kind of the evolution. Um, this was obviously DEF CON 10. 
we had essentially two book PCs that we had purchased and through, I think it was two interfaces in each for a total of three in each box. So we had basically f four network segments, a public network segment, a goon network segment, a private network segment, and well, I think there was one more. But anyway, uh, it basically allowed us to have some segmentation and segregation. And we, we also kind of played it off that we wanted all the public traffic on one firewall and all the, the semi-private, semi-trusted on another firewall so that if the public firewall got compromised, you know, the, the private and the trusted stuff wouldn't be compromised at the same time. Um, and then, I, yeah, I don't think we, we didn't do any VLANs this year. We basically plugged it all into physical networking gear. <laughs> Knows your IP. Oh yeah. <coughs> then um, the next year, I believe, we went on eBay, our favorite place, uh, picked up, I think it was two Dell 1550s for pretty cheap. Basically put in, uh, does anybody remember the QFE cards? Quad fast ethers from Sun. Borrowed a couple of those, stuck them in the boxes, and we had uh, basically four or six interfaces on each box. So five, five and five could be segmented out. Um, this year, I believe, I think we also had a couple of switches that were, you know, we had a public switch that was segmented off with VLANs, and then we had a couple other switches that were uh, segmented off with VLANs. So we're, now we're, we're moving into the, into the realm where we didn't have enough gear to be able to support, you know, uh, what is it, 12 network segments, right? So we kind of did VLANs. And it worked. Um, and it worked quite well, because now we're able to create all these different net network segments at the bottom here and keep people from owning other, other individuals across the network. <coughs> um, so then we continued on. Uh, I think we used the Dell 1550s for two years. They're kind of big boxes. Does anybody remember the Dell 1550s? They're one year, yeah. yeah. Yes, yep. really long. I know. Nine. We had to ship those. Yes, yeah. We had buttons in the back. We had to ship those uh, several years back and forth. And I think the second year we shipped them, the boxes finally gave out. I mean, you know, it's just the cardboard boxes that you get from Dell or whatever. But um, all right. So let's see what else was there in this picture. So again, uh, it's all going back to a Cisco. Uh, switch now. We've now moved from multiple switches to one switch because we're kind of a little, getting a little bit comfortable, more comfortable with the fact that VLAN hop, hop, hopping attacks are not as prevalent and the code has been patched, hopefully, right? Um, then the next year, I went to run OpenBSD. I loaded it up, got all the firewalls loaded on there, and I can't remember if I, I may have patched the kernel to the most re recent rev because uh, there was some sort of an IPv6 issue in the kernel and it broke the, the quad fast ethers. So here I am with uh, two boxes that can't use you know, the, the eight interfaces. So I was kind of shitting bricks like, oh crap, what are we going to do, right? I, I remember that I had a QFD in an OpenBSD box and it wouldn't ARP correctly unless it was in promiscuous mode, or I mean, or some, I mean, that was the issue. Yeah, some, some weird thing. Well, this didn't even recognize the card. Like, it wouldn't even see the interfaces, which was very frustrating, because, like, literally, we're, you know, I think we're setting this up on a Monday. We're trying to get it going, and I'm like, why the heck is this not working? It should just be working. Um, so I was like, all right, screw it. We're going to create a VLAN trunk. Created a VLAN trunk off the, the back side of the firewall. Uh, both of those trunks went into the, the central switch, and you know, lo and behold, we now have reduced the number of network connections that we need, and it's now all virtualized, essentially, to the, to the firewall. Uh, it works great. Um, so, pretty much the same. I think this year, well, I think we got it DEF CON 13, so you can kind of see this VLAN 100 to 132, that's what we kind of slotted in for the Aruba controller. We didn't quite know what we were going to do with it, but that's how we sort of had set it up. 
Um, the next year we had a little bit better idea of how we're going to do that Aruba controller. Um, does anybody know how those access points work? They're basically stupid. You know, they don't have a, uh, I mean they have an IP but it's on a management network and they basically get a load uh, from the controller and they have a GRE tunnel. So they take wireless frames, pack them up, throw it across to the, the controller and the controller actually does the, the logic in the ASIC to manage the wireless frames. Um, which is cool. Um, I think I think I've got a slide that talks about that. But yeah. all right, uh, do, 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 do. fun stuff. <coughs> so now we move on to DefCon 14. This is our first year at the Riviera. We actually had um, real life real live fiber that we could use. Uh, essentially, our core switch room was over here uh, by, the, by that, uh, what was that, the uh, Royale. Kitchen. The kitchen, yeah, it was basically the kitchen was back behind there. Um, we had switches in this little bathroom IDF. Like literally you'd walk in and there's a toilet and then there's a fence and then there's the IDF. So that was kind of interesting. I think that the, it was for staff use only, but anyway. Um, we had a switch that was up, up in the catwalk the, above the Roya, or, uh, Grande ballroom. And we had switches behind the business center um, that would basically extend out the Wi-Fi and anything else to this, uh, the chill out area is what it was this year, or that year I should say. And then we had a fiber run that went up to our knock. Uh, we had a fiber run that went up to our knock. Um, over here, and then we had a Cat 5, yeah. cat, cat 6, I think, that ran out to the Aruba switch that did gigabit out to the Aruba. And the Aruba switch lived in the ceiling. I mean, literally all the way out in the center of the, the convention space, um, just from the perspective that it had all the power over Ethernet ports that we needed for that, that density. And you can kind of see, <coughs> here's what, um, what the map looked like for the access point density. So the Aruba controller, lived kind of in the center of this pavilion uh, up here and would basically power all those access points up in the ceiling. Worked out really well from the perspective that you know we didn't have to buy another PoE injector or PoE switches. That's the hardest part when you're dealing with all this stuff is you know we don't have an endless budget to, to buy stuff. And, and I was gonna say well it's really easy to get you know some cables run up in the ceilings so they just tend not to run power. Yeah, what you do. no power. I mean, that's a whole other union, right? It's all got to be PLE. <laughs> union. Anyway. I'm sorry, it's a 6,000. Yeah, yeah, the, the little, yeah, little bedded ones are good. So AP70 access points, um, 18 were... APs at DEF CON 14 to 28 APs now at DEF CON 18. Um, and four air monitors at DEF CON 14, now we're at 10 air monitors at DEF CON 18. Um, so, you know, basically that if you've worked with the Aruba gear, an air monitor basically looks for nasty traffic, looks for things that are potentially being, you know, man in the middle, that kind of stuff. Um, oh, and, and just general signal strength and crosstalk between the, the access points. Because they're constantly adjusting as they go along. You know, people move into a space, start signing, you know, registering with the access points. It uh, it changes its its signal strength as well as what channels <coughs> it's uh, on to accommodate them. And um, so this year we had upwards of 2,000 concurrent users on the network, which is the maximum I think we've ever seen on the network at any one time, which is awesome. I mean we. We provided a secure way for people to register and then authenticate to the network. And it, it seems to be working out pretty well. So 425 gigabits in, 327 gigabits out. I don't know. Mostly BitTorrent. Yeah. Which I think I, oh no, I don't know if we have that quality of service. But if you use IRC at DEF CON, you get like 2% of the bandwidth because I put in a quality service rule. Anyway. 
If you use the port. Use the port, yeah, 6666 or 6667. I think I've got both of those in the PF uh, alt Q rules. Um, so again, you know, it basically it has to be accessible to the public for, for Wi-Fi requirements. Absolutely has to be reliable. Uh, we, you know, if somebody's in an area where they can't get it, uh, chances are they're obviously not going to be able to use it. So we need to make sure that our coverage is good, right? Um, we also want to protect the infrastructure and then protect the users. So at DEF CON 18, obviously, we, we put, up, put up the WPA2, which means that you're going to have an encrypted session between you and the controller. Um, and this is, these are all Louise's slides. I feel bad, because I'm like trying to talk through them, and I'm not the Wi-Fi guy. <coughs> but, you know, Channel out allocation is, a, is a, a definite issue from the perspective that you've got all these access points that are sitting in the same area. They're all going to see each other. Um, they potentially could collide with each other. Uh, user density, we kind of talked about that at the beginning. That's also a big issue. You know, if you've got so many users in an area, chances are that one's going to squash the other. Uh, roaming and mobility. So when, uh, when we started out, I, I kind of had the the requirement that, okay, um, a couple of years, ago, well, many years ago, we had someone do DHCP pool exhaustion attacks. You know, basically, they had a Perl script that would go through and request all the leases in a, in a space. And we'd be like, actually, we, I, I, you get a call, oh, I can't get on the network, I can't get on the network. And you go look at the leases, oh, okay, well, let me reboot the DHCPD, all right, try again. Um, or, you know, kill it and start it again. So basically, my, my concept was, all right, let's put up 30 VLANs. 30 VLANs with, you know, like slash 16s for, for lease pools. So if you can't get on one, you know, shut down your laptop, move, you know, 50 feet, and start up your laptop, you're going to be on a different access point. And the way these access points work is they basically have a base VLAN assigned to each access point. So when you come up and you, know, you see this access point that's over your head, or the, you know, your laptop does, it, it associates with that access point, which has, uh, let's say, VLAN 1 is, is tied to it. So now you get a lease off of VLAN 1, which then roams with you throughout the conference. So if you, as you move to other access points, that VLAN just switches to the, to the next access point. Now, if another user were to come in and you know, say you've got access point 3 over in the corner, and they see access point 3, they're on VLAN 3, for all intents and purposes, and that roams with them as well. Um, just from the perspective that if someone's going to DDoS you know, one of those networks, they're going to have to get on every access point and do that. Right? They're going to have to walk through the conference and try and associate with all the access points in order to DDoS all of the, the DHCP leases. Does that make sense? And, and it's one of those things, when you go into these situations, you know you're not going to stop everyone from doing everything. But you want to at least set a bar such that it, it's, there's an annoyance It's there. futile, hopefully, right? Yeah. I mean, we're, yeah, we're not, it's not like we're actually trying to do anything really cool, really sly. It's just, yeah. just enough so that people go, oh, I guess it's really not, there's not much of a point because I'm only going to DOS one access point throughout, throughout the conference when there's you know, 28 more that, that I would need to go to. All right. Uh, do, do, do. Oh, minimize the risks through the infrastructure. Um, basically, when you connect up to the, and we've been doing this for, I think, um, what's that? There you go. I, I think we've, we've been basically disallowing peer-to-peer uh, -peer ever since we started it. So if you're on the wireless network, uh, the unencrypted network, you still can't talk to each other. You can only go out to the internet. Uh, and then now with the WPA2 network, if you're on that network, you same thing. You can only talk out to the internet. None of the other parties inside that WPA2 network can talk to each other. Uh, any traffic that's going to be routed uh, has to go up to the firewall, and the firewall has to make the decision whether or not to allow it out. So, and we basically put rules in that say if you're a wireless client, you can go out to the internet. That's it. You can't go to any other internal networks unless we say so. So there's a couple of public networks that. I mean, a couple public servers like the info, service. info, 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 booth. Ser, inf, info booth services that we publish. Certificate so. server. 
What's that? The cer uh, certificate server. Oh, the certificate. Mm -hmm. Uh, registration one? Registration, yeah, the registration server, which is available external and internal. So, so you can register for a username and password for the WPA2 network. Uh, we talked a little bit about device compatibility. <laughs> Downloads FireSheep. FireSheep's himself. Oh, there's the Aruba. So this is uh, the Aruba actually mounted in the ceiling with zip ties. Uh, hung way up in the ceiling, and all the, the access points essentially connected up to it. Which, I mean, is kind of a pain, because uh, I think there were a couple of times when Louise is like, oh shit, I gotta go out there now. <laughs> you know, and so you gotta go get the AV guy, get the union guy, and they bring you out, and put you up on the lift, and you plug in via the console cable, and hopefully manage the system, so. And the, the power for that guy was actually run as well as the, the network port was run from the NOC. Yeah, so we had a big S extension cord yeah, like running 100 out. Foot, yeah, 100 foot. Yeah, 150-foot extension. 150-foot extension cord. And then they took these cables out every year, which is really annoying. But has anybody ever heard of the fire marshal? <laughs> Does everybody remember how, I think it was DEF CON 14, how we're two and a half hours late opening because of the fire marshal? Yeah. So I think they left these cables in there one year, and then the next year we came back, they're like, no, we had to pull it out. Fire marshal was coming. Ugh. So we you know, had to have them run, it out, run brand new cables again. Um, I think, again, this is <coughs> WPA2, or uh, the Wi-Fi stuff. Um, Block inner user communication, that's what I was talking about as far as we don't allow peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Uh, proper use of VLANs and subnets kind of helps reduce some of the risks. Um, power over Ethernet, is, it was a big thing for us. I mean, we only had enough or, or one switch that would power most of the APs, and then we were kind of like, oh, well, we got to get some, some switches. Um, we got a Linksys switch, a cheap-ass Linksys switch for, I don't know, 500 bucks or something. And the management interface is atrocious. It's a web page, and you have to like wait for it to refresh and click and wait for it to, it's just, yeah, it's, it's junk. Um, and it would only power, I think, 12 of the access points, even though it was a 24 port switch. 11. 11. 11, 11. yes. We were, we were running at 15 watts, and it would do, you know. Uh, yeah, as soon as you plugged in the, the last one, it would power cycle, and yeah. yeah. It's just like, Christ. So we're planning to, we actually are planning to buy five new power over Ethernet switches this year because we don't have the luxury of kind of trying to do jury rig stuff. We, yeah. I mean, basically we have, um, at the, the Rio, we have a lot of closets that this stuff's going to have to go into, so. Yeah, and I mean, especially being the first year at the Rio, we don't have a good idea exactly where everything is because sometimes the floor plan isn't even finalized. Yeah. Well, period. Period, yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be in the resume, but uh, there's also some wireless IPS stuff that goes into it. Um, I think that's like the detecting, you know, man in the middle attacks and subverting them. Um, a couple years ago, this was at the Alexis Park many years ago. Um, there was a Wi Fi networking contest. I think it was like King of the Hill or something that people were running. And um, apparently their, their contest kept failing, like the access point just stopped working. And um, I think by the end of the con, they came back and were kind of talking with us. And they're like, yeah, we, we can't get this going. So we just shut it down. We're like, oh, was that this access point? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we just dosed it. I mean, we thought you were a rogue AP. <laughs> 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 they're like, oh. All right. So, I mean, we do have the power to do that with the air monitors. That, that's pretty nice. You can just say, kill, yeah. done. No matter how, how much you bring, we probably have more, air, you know, more access points out there. But yeah. Not that we're challenging anyone. <laughs> Again, making it harder, not necessarily perfect. Who watches Breaking In? It's canceled. It's canceled, all right. Uh, not anymore, anymore. Not anymore. Thinks it's real. Yeah. 
All right, so future slash conclusion, right? Uh, new hotel, Rio is going to rock. I mean, basically, um, we went and did a pre-con there in March this year, and you can fit all of the convention space inside of the Rio and have a lot more room. So that's going to be really, really nice. Hopefully that means no more waiting in lines. Hopefully it means more, more room, more, more seats in a room. There'll be yeah. better lines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> better lines. Um, more gigabits. Has anybody heard that? Gigabits. So you go to your vendor and instead of saying uh, gigabit or gigabit, go, you know, whatever gigabit interfaces, you say gigabits. And after a while it catches on and they start saying it. Good gigabits. Yes, we want the one with more good gigabits. Do you have the Wi Fi's? Does it print money? <laughs> I want an I I want an iPhone four. I want a white one. Anyway. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> more addresses, obviously we're you know, we're gonna have to have more address spaces. Uh, are we doing IPv six? Yeah, we're going six. Yeah. We gotta work out some things with the Aruba, but yeah, we have to do a firmware upgrade on this the Aruba. Oh uh, yeah, it's it's we, it's going to be easy to own that. We're going to have more segmentation with regards to our our networks, but but yeah, there's we we just yeah you know, that whole thing about buying stuff on a budget. We don't have the switches which are able to do the RA guards to prevent that. So it's already more right past that. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's just the nature of V6. So. Uh, we'll have separate networks. So you can reason to it. Just take some work. Yeah. I mean, there, there's some controls we can put in place, and we're obviously going to be monitoring for it, which goes down to a little bit about. Yeah. You know, we we keep throwing around the idea of just inviting vendors in to put up their IDSs just to see what happens. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, come on in. You you have no time to tune it, and uh, good luck. Yeah, we we had. Um, Oh, Agent X was working for a company <laughs> where he had access to a gear one year that was supposed to uh, like do some sort of inline packet analysis or something. And within about 15 minutes of it being on, we're like, okay, turn it off. It's blocking all our traffic. Yeah. So it got removed very quickly. Um, no, it was blocking everything. Yeah. <laughs> it well, wasn't doing its job. Yeah, it's more secure yeah. if you can't get out to the internet. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's that whole, you know, confidentiality, or no, no, uh, cost, security, and usability. If it's not usable, it's not very effective. Anyway, um, logging, we, we do have a syslog server that we log stuff to. Hopefully we'll have some more logging. I, I think I might bring in uh, one of the Trustwave uh, sims that we have. I, I've been promised one of those, so. And uh, Lackey, I don't know. And I mean, we're also I'm, we're trying to think through some ways of actually you know, sending some of this out. Like obviously, the the table of doom and wolf sheep are there for people to do packet analysis. But you know, if we wanted to start doing stuff along the lines of, all right, you can you can listen to our syslog traffic, or you can listen to you know some of the any of the IDS reports that come in. It's like, do you, do you want to see this? Like. What, so, you know, if you, if you have some thoughts or want to talk about it afterwards, feel free to find us. We're open to ideas. Uh, DefConNetworking.org is the site. Uh, we, you know, if there's any updates or announcements about the network, it's generally up there. Like, hey, we're doing this, or WPA doesn't work, or this is how you get your iPhone to work, or, or whatever. We've had to post things to that so that people know how to, how to do stuff on the network. Um, and then EEQ, uh, Dave Bullock. His photos are all throughout this presentation. Great job. And Effin as well. Uh, I think he did the one up on the scissors lift. For, but anyway, anything else? Fun stuff. Q, Q &A, I guess. Yeah. So do you guys have any questions? I mean, we're open to talk about any of this stuff. The uh, walkthrough or you know, whatever you did uh, at the Rio, how, so did, our, yeah, our how did you actually? How actually did you do that? Did you actually get to go through all the closets? Did you get to see where things are going to be, or is it mostly paper? And so, the walkthrough. Um, you know, it would have been nice if they had a paper with all the stuff, because then we could have pointed to it, like, oh, okay, we got to put stuff here and here and here. Um, unfortunately, they're like, um, yeah, well, we have this, uh, you know, building layout. Oh, okay. Where, what goes where? Well, you know, we just know that. 
Yeah, there's, there's no such thing as an as-built. It just yeah. it doesn't exist. It's so like, we did literally walk through all the closets that we would potentially be using. Like, oh, okay, we can put equipment in here. We can put equipment in here. Here's this block of fiber that goes somewhere, and hopefully we can hook it up. I think it goes back to their head end, which they didn't want to show us. Oh, yeah. So... <laughs> than the RIV when you left. There's no real... Uh, they're more sophisticated as far as... They are. Yeah, because they've got fiber to every closet, every area. So, like, the Rio is broken up into multiple areas, I think, as they uh, expanded, maybe? I don't... Yeah, yeah. As, as so, they've, down, yeah, they've got a new, or a new space and an old space. The old space is closer to the center of the hotel. The new space is further out. And, like, the wiring closets are kind of weird, but we'll figure it out relationship with the staff at the uh, RIV, obviously. Uh, at the Rio, are you, do you have their IT people freaking out? or? So the, the question is, you know, we, we did build a, a trust relationship and reputation with the Riviera. Is the Rio going to be the same way? Um, well, it, it's in our resume and our contract, so they kind of have to be nice, you know? I mean, if they're not nice, we're going to say, well, you guys have to reduce your price or, you know, change something or whatever. I mean, it's contractual obligation that the network is part of that. Um, yeah, and, and I, think, the I think they're going to be good. You know, we, we went and sat down with them, and they were very amicable to all the stuff that we're talking about. They weren't like, oh, I'm not going to do that, you know? I, I think... To some degree, they're kind of relieved that we bring in our, our own network because then that means the AA they don't have to manage it, and B they don't have to worry about crosstalk. You know, if if it were their own network equipment, they might have to worry about something. Yeah. You know? right, right now, all they have to focus on are the uh, the guest rooms and the and their public spaces. Yeah. Um, they don't ooh, have to worry about anything ooh, ooh. from ours. We forgot to talk about DCTV. Yes. So, also in our contract, we basically said we want a hotel channel. Or actually, we want four, four of them. So that's what we're doing. And they um, have to be high def. Yes. Sorry if that part didn't work out. Yeah. Right, but the head end couldn't do high def. We negotiated down. Yeah. But so we're going to broadcast the talks in all the rooms. That's our goal. Just like the Alexis Park. So uh, it'll probably be on the pay per view because we kind of, you know, there's supposedly other people in the hotel or something, you know. <laughs> we, since we can't actually get a. Uh, uh, television rating on DEF CON, or at least if we did, we probably wouldn't want to Might be NC-17. Yeah. You know, all those people um, dancing around on the stage. Anyway. So yeah, it it's just has to be handled that way. So yeah, we're getting the TV channels back, which is good. Other questions? You guys doing any stuff in 5 gigahertz? Are we doing any stuff in 5 gigahertz? So we're... I don't know that the AP70s will do the 5 gig stuff. And we uh, don't have enough of the... Well, and the firmware doesn't do... The, the firmware that we have, we're actually... We are in the process of figuring out what the cost of a support license is so we can upgrade the firmware on the controller. And then we can see if we can do the 5 gig. So I run a little teeny bitty by comparison, a little tiny speck on the conference called Barcamp in San Diego. And uh, I poked Aruba and I said, hey, um, I hear you guys work with the DEF CON guys. This is before we met. And uh, uh, they said, well, yes. And I said, uh, I'd like a taste of that, please. And they said, mm, OK, here. And they gave me a uh, mobility controller 200 and three AP125s. Now, the AP125s will do 5 gigahertz. So oh, okay. it might be in your best interest to poke them and say, hey, um, we're back. We have a better reputation. We can make your product look really, really cool. Um, we need 44 of them. Yeah, yeah, 44 APs, yeah. It's worth a shot network brought to you by Aruba. Yeah, the network brought to you by Aruba. Exactly, and that's a big deal when you have 10,000 people. So yeah. it might be worth it to poke them to see what they do. Yeah, I think it would be. I think we've got, it's like 20 of the newer AP 125s, I think. Yeah, the little little guys. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Oh, maybe. It's not the 125. No, 80s? Yeah, it's not 76, They're like little biscuits. So anyway, you know, you know, impress a lot of people with, with you know influence on buying decisions in a lot of corporate networks. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and anytime I talk about stuff, I've done um, pen tests, I've done architecture reviews, uh, and I you know of the Cisco gear versus the Aruba gear. Hands down, the Cisco gear just doesn't work, right? The Aruba gear just works. 
you know, as far as like detecting rogue access points or detecting attacks, um, the Aruba gear is much more sophisticated than the Cisco gear. And it's a pain in the ass to manage, the Cisco gear is, in my opinion. But, you know, that's what happens when you just like buy companies and try to cram it together. So, sorry Cisco, if anybody's from Cisco out here, you, your product doesn't work so great. At least as far as the Wi-Fi stuff goes. All right, any other questions? Fun stuff. Is everybody coming to DEF CON this year? All right, good. Excellent. It, it should be a, a great experience. I'm really looking forward to the new hotel. Uh, looking forward to all the things that are going to be going on. And there's tons of contests, you know, tons of things to do. Um, I think they're running a tamper contest there as well. So if you want to get in on that stuff, that's pretty fun. Um, I don't know what else is there. I think, um, yeah. did someone pick up Mystery Box? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't know, there's uh, DEF CON forums. I, I haven't really, something. what's that? Uh -huh. No. Anyway. So feel free to come up and ask us questions later. I mean, I'm am amicable to talking and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, my email is there, um, my work email, and then my personal email, and then uh, Louise's and Max. So, if you have any questions, feel free to send us an email. Thank you. Thank you very much.